start with the um, afternoon session. Okay, so we will now have uh, the third lecture of uh, Laura Donnet on celestial amplitudes. Thank you, Francesco. Thanks everybody uh, for coming. Good afternoon, I hope you can hear me in the back, yes. Um, okay, so today we will finally come to uh, talking about celestial amplitudes per se after uh, these two first lectures where um, we had to make a detour to understand what was the uh, detailed uh, structure of the uh, flat space in the infrared and we saw all these nice symmetries and that they had charges and that these charges were constraining the scattering problem uh, for massless particles in flat space times. And today we will see, uh, so we will go um, to uh, now the definition of what uh, celestial amplitudes and then we see that this uh, essentially amounts to have um, a very nice organizing, uh, way, uh, very nice way of organizing um, scattering uh, elements in flat space time which uh, will make the SL2C transformation of, of, uh, of the Lorentz group very uh, manifest. And this uh, eventually will help us to understand what is the potential uh, holographic structure of gravity, quantum gravity in flat space in terms of the so-called celestial conformal field theory. So let me uh, recall briefly what was the last message of uh, last lecture. So yesterday, uh, I tried to uh, advocate that there was a nice interpretation of soft uh, photon, and we mostly discussed actually soft graviton insertions. in the quantum gravity S matrix. As a world identity, for uh, some two-dimensional currents, and these 2D currents, um, manifest the rich asymptotic structure at the boundary of flat space. So for, um, for gravity, we had uh, these currents were given by the super translation currents, which I will come back to it when we will talk about uh, celestial CFT. We will come with a nice definition for this current. We also had for um, gauge theory, this this uh, U1 Kachmudi current, which is whose insertion is responsible for the leading soft photon theorem. This guy gives you the leading soft graviton theorem. And I mentioned, uh, and we will come to a concrete construction for this object, that, but that there is an object which plays a role of the stress tensor in a, very much like we are used to in, in uh, usual 2D conformal field theories. So that was the main message of yesterday. And today we will now uh, go to the core of these lectures, which is to talk about celestial amplitudes. So let's, uh, in order to present you this uh, celestial map that um, maps the particle states to uh, objects in the 2D sphere, let me just briefly introduce some aspects about Lorentz transformations and the celestial sphere, which I recall is the two-dimensional Euclidean, Euclidean sphere at uh, future null infinity, which is item, identifully, uh, I antipodally identified with the past null infinity. So we have, uh, let me write down the Lorentz algebra. Just to sl start slowly. Where 
where I use the notation uh, J, I, so I is one, two, or three. J's are my three rotations. K's one, two, three are the three boosts. And these are the commutation relation between these objects. And we are also very, uh, well, we know that there is an isomorphism between uh, the Lorentz algebra and this SL2C algebra, which is also something uh, you have seen in other lectures here. So the Lorentz generator are here denoted by the usual LMs mode. And this is or their commutation relation. Where M and N are so minus one, zero, one. And okay, there is a precise uh, way how to obtain uh, this L in, front, uh, in, in function of the rotation and boost generator. Uh, let me not write all these down because you can find this in most of textbooks, but let me just write one of these relations, just have an ID. Okay. So um, now um, we will need, I, and actually I, I've already kind of introduced that in the, in the previous lecture, but we'll make a choice for an embedding of how the celestial sphere is embedding into a Minkowski. So, of the celestial sphere into actually the, the, null, the null code. So there is no unique way to do, to do that, but there is a, a nice form of the embedding which I can take and I've already actually introduced that when we were talking about scattering on massless particle and this is the choice for, if you remember the particle has this momentum p mu, which I written uh, omega, the energy time this null vector yesterday. So we have seen this expression already before and it gives me uh, an embedding of the celestial sphere. And of course there is not, you could make another choice for this embedding, but this one uh, turns out to be very convenient for uh, this, all these celestial uh, amplitude purposes. So now a very, I mean, the, the key observation which is behind, behind all this story is very simple. It's just the fact that the Lorentz group acts on the celestial sphere uh, via a Möbius or SL2C uh, transformations on these uh, sphere coordinates W and W bar. where this is the usual SL2C transformations similarly on W bar. So this is just a symmetry observation. ED minus B is equal to one. Yes, 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 yes. So now, uh, by using this just uh, simple observation, and I will come to precisely uh, how one can perform this map explicitly. If I, I write the S matrix element into a basis which uh, manifest, which uh, express in a manifest way the SL2C uh, invariance uh, or covariance that acts on the celestial sphere, then by construction, this object written in this sort of basis 
will uh, transform covariantly on the radiation of SL2C. And this is precisely what we are aiming at. We are aiming at eventually interpreting these S matrix element in this basis. And again, I will, I will just now define how you can perform this uh, change of basis. So by construction, you will have this SL2C manifest uh, transformation laws. And celestial holography or celestial amplitudes is the statement that we will want to interpret these elements uh, as a correlation function, so as something totally different um, of operators which represent the massless particle in the theory which is this uh, so-called celestial conformal field theory. So that's the main uh, goal of, what's the, that's the main objective of this transformation that I will, uh, I will present now in more detail, talking about conformal primary wave function. Uh, Laura, uh, sorry, stupid question. So N is the number of particles yes, involved yes. into the scattering? Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry. So basically, the, the usual... Uh, is it? So someone is not muted, I guess, online. So the usual drawing that people do is that if you have a n scat uh, a par a scattering process involving n particle here, n equal to five. you will see or reinterpret this thing as some correlation function as insertion of operator. So each operator here, operator, which uh, represents a massless particle which here is the celestial sphere at a point, the given point W, W bar. And the delta will come to it, but it will be the dual variable of the energy. I will precisely come to that. So you, you will see this scattering process as some insertion of operators. So if you have two incoming, and three outgoing, they will all live on the same celestial sphere. So this follows from the fact that, remember we had some antipodal matching between the past and the future. In principle, you might think there is one celestial sphere at the past and one at the future, but this antipodal matching is precisely ma made in such a way that uh, uh, these, these two regions are identified to each other in such a way that a free massless particle will enter and exit the celestial sphere at the same point. So this all comes from this antipodal matching condition I've written. The main message is that there is only one celestial sphere and we will have insertion of operators which represent creation of, well, the, the, a massless particle coming from the past and versus at a given point the sphere, w, w, w bar, and we have n of them in principle. So uh, this uh, correlation, uh, can it be interpreted as uh, coming from some specific null coordinate? Because presumably uh, the scaling dimensions refer to the Fourier transform uh, in uh, the retarded or advanced null coordinates, right? Uh, so uh, in some sense, uh, they are uh, smeared all over uh, scry minus or scry plus. Uh. So um, this dimension is not quite the Fourier transform. Mm -hmm. of the of the neither the energy nor the there is a melin transform associated to that and i, I will come to this precise mapping uh, i see but right I, I mean uh, does it correspond to strictly local uh, insertions uh, on uh, no, some no 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 okay. as you say it, it it involves at the end it involves an integral over see, all all retarded points i see uh, so it's some there's some smearing uh, yes there. there is some smearing you're right thank you 
So, okay, let's go to this, this map. I mean, what is this delta? How is it defined? So, conformal primary wave functions, abbreviated by CPW. So, let's, um, so all the magic will be uh, done by this integral transform called um, a in transform. So, let's consider again uh, a non channel plane wave can be incoming or outgoing. Uh, plus or minus i omega q mu uh, x mu, where x are the Cartesian coordinates. So here plus or minus is uh, in versus out. So as we have seen, we can parameterize the null momenta by three quantity, the energy and the point WW bar at which the particle passes the sphere. And this Mellin transform that will make the magic for us, namely trading the omega for this delta. And this is uh, how the celestial map is impl implemented. So a Mellin transform, the definition of, a, of this transform is as follows. an integral transform over a variable that is here will, will be the energy and the particle. So this is the Mellin transform of a function f, which depends on omega. It returns uh, a new function, which now uh, depends on uh, this variable here that appears in the integral transform. That's the Mellin transform. There are some uh, assumptions on on this function f to, for the Mellin transform to be uh, well defined. If you're interested, you can go in, you can ask me reference for, for this, but I don't want to enter into too much detail. So delta in principle can be, uh, is generally complex in this expression and take, so this form. And I will go, come back to, to that. So in principle, delta is uh, an arbitrary uh, complex. There is um, a well-defined um, inverse transform, so you can invert this Mellin integral, modulo some, some, uh, some assumptions, but, um, but there is a, a way to invert, uh, invert this map. So notice that there is an, and then notice that there is an inverse melin under some assumption. Uh, it's about the analyticity of this F tilde on some complex strip. We will not need all these details, but just to tell you that you can go back and forth under some assumption. Uh, Okay, so what I will call a conformal primary wave function is simply a Mellin transform of a plane wave packet. So let me start with, a, so now I'm starting with a scalar conformal primary wave function. So this is the definition of what I mean. So. We'll have a bunch of labels, so we have to be careful about all these labels because we don't want to neither confuse you nor be too sketchy. So a conformal primary wave function, which can be incoming or outgoing, depending on whether the plane wave is incoming or outgoing, is defined as the Mellin transform of the wave packet. And it will carry, now it will no longer be labeled by energy omega, but rather now by this quantity, this complex delta. So I'm just writing this Mellin transform for a plane wave. And this epsilon here, just some regulator, which is there to ensure that 
the inter in integral converges, which is positive. So that's the definition. I will let me introduce some stupid extra label that is not necessary here, but when we'll be talking about uh, spinning uh, wave functions, we will have to introduce another label, which is uh, spin. And here, since I'm talking about scalar conformal primaries, this label will just be dumb and just be equal to zero. But in, in more in general, we'll have we can define more general uh, spinning uh, primaries. So this integral can be computed. Actually, you can in Mathematica just gives you what's the answer, and the result is given by this, where you have this appearance of this regulator here in the denominator. So it's plus or minus i to a delta gamma function of delta divided by q dot x to the power delta. So why are we interested in this? Well, because now the nice thing about these functions, is, as their name suggests, is that phi transforms now as a bulk as a scalar under the bulk Lorentz transformations. So you see that this object depends both on the bulk coordinate x and also on, on the point w, w bar on the sphere. So it's just a scalar under the Lorentz. But under the action which of the Lorentz, which is induced by, by this uh, embedding, so on this SL2C action on acting on W at W bar, it transforms, as, as you will see, a 2D conformal or quasi-conformal primary. Because now I'm just looking at globe, the global part of, of the conformal group with a given weights, like the weights that we are used to write down into the CFC h, h bar, under SL2C. So I will write down the transformation rule so that this sentence takes some flesh. So if I do a Lorentz transformation on the coordinate which is accompanied by a Möbius transformation on the angles W, W bar. And then I could have just written down W prime, this is W bar prime. The transformation rule is that you can check that this is true. And there are two ways of express, expressing the weights, either in terms of h and h bar, either in terms of the conformal dimension in the spin, and they are related via this equation. The conformal dimension, as usual, is the sum of h and h bar, while the spin, the 2D spin, is the is the difference, so here it's actually zero, but when we will generalize this to spinning particles, it will no longer be zero. So equivalently, this, this is actually, hmm. well, to, if you're more familiar with this way of writing the conformal transformations, here is an unequivalent way of writing that. So you should recognize this as the transformation rule of a primary of which weights h and h bar. Is it clear? So what we are just doing is we are mailing transform, maybe in this integral transform on the plane waves. And this 
the reason why we are doing that is because now we have made uh, the SL2C action manifest. So in, in summary, usually we write uh, in a momentum basis where particles are labeled by their energy. Here in this uh, boost, or uh, let's say, let's call it celestial basis. Particle will be uh, represented by this complex number delta. And we go from one to the other via this Mellin transform. And if we have a, sp a spinning particle in the bulk, it will carry a, uh, that's the energy, it will carry a helicity L. And this will be simply identified with the 2D spin in this, uh, it just will be equated. So this is 2D spin. Formal dimension. Okay, so now there is a, a state, uh, um, a comment I would like to make, which turned out to be um, rather important. Ah, before before uh, before uh, I write that, maybe I just mention that. This phi delta, another way to state this is just that they are uh, complex now, uh, highest weights with respect to the Lorentz group. So this is just another way just to write down what the weights are. So since this is a scalar, zero, they satisfy this relationships where these L are the Lorentz generator I've written before. So basically, the, now the, the action of the boost is diagonalized. Well, in the usual momentum basis, we have an, a, mani a nice, the plane wave transform manifestly, uh, nicely under translations, but the SL2C transformation is obscured. Now it's the other way around. We will have, in this boost basis, the, SL, the transformation under SL2C will, will be very nice, but now the price to pay is that the transformations under translations will be more obscured. And I will get back to that later on. Is there any question on, the, on that? Yes. I, I, I have two questions. First of all, um, this action of SL2C on W can be just derived from the definition of the complex coordinate on the celestial sphere. Um, up to, well, there, there is no unique way that this will in, induce a unique way to write this down. So this, this will depend on, on, on this embedding. So it's actually equivalent to choose a li the little group, uh, choice for a little group. But if you give, if basically, if I give, if you give me a, a given embedding, then yes, you can derive this, uh, uh, you can derive this in a new, unique way. Okay, so, um, okay, but, uh, okay, this two coordinate, the W is essentially, does not contain uh, more information than X, no? It's just a way to parameterize uh, the limit for, uh, for, for the distance going to infinity. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the Lorentz group will, it, the transformation on the bulk coordinates will, ac will induce a transformation uh, on, the, on the angles at the sphere at infinity. So they go hand in hand. So. Yeah, okay, so, but uh, I, I'm not understanding why when you write the fields, mm -hmm. you, you write both X and W, like if they are independent coordinates. Well, so in principle, it's, it's uh, so it's like, you know, uh, a plane wave in principle depends on the, on the, um, on the, on the bulk point, and which is defined, but also has a, mo a momenta which is pointing towards a point in the sphere. So if you uh, want okay. here also, this plane wave is also an object which depends both on X and on this Q. But now this Q, I'm, I'm choosing an embedding which 
where this Q is parameterized by W W bar. Okay, okay. So it's just it's the same stuff, but now in this in this basis somehow. It's just we are not used to that because we are not used to uh, write the null momenta, I guess, uh, uh, like so. But there's nothing. Uh, okay, so the W is the um, large distance limit of the dual variable of uh, of x. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. So exactly. So this this object is de it defined at any bulk point x, but um, now I will want. So it's a bit what we did yesterday when uh, we pushed this wave, uh, this uh, this function to the boundary by taking an large R limit, and then I mentioned this uh, saddle prompt approximation computation that I didn't uh, show, but basically when when you will push this to the boundary, it will. Uh, it will make, you know, the angles, let's say Z here, which are included, you know, in bond decoder, you have U R Z Z bar. It will make Z and Z bar to coincide with W and W bar. Okay. When you take the larger, you're right. Yes, I know it's a bit, it might be confusing this double thing, but uh, it's nothing but, again, if you look at the plane wave, just inherited from, from this and this relation. So now let me uh, make a comment. So the statement that uh, plane waves uh, form a delta function normalizable basis, which is a statement where these things denote the klein gordon in your product. I can write down uh, quickly the, the definition I'm using for the klein gordon uh, two, two massless stuff. So we are familiar with the fact that the plane waves form a delta function uh, normalizable basis which, which uh, Press like so. Okay. So this statement translates into uh, the celestial language in the following way. It, this statement will impose some constraint on the value of delta. So more precisely, what you can do is just you take this expression here, you do two Mellin transform, one for the first plane wave, one for the second, and you will uh, find the klein gorin in your product of two primary wave functions. Let me just write W, and not every time W and W bar, but. So there is one evaluated that, on, that depends on W, one on W prime. So it can be in and out. So if you do a Mellin transform, the two Mellin here, you can compute this. So the left hand side is equal to that by definition of what is a conformal primary. But at some point you will hit some integral and you will see that this integral doesn't converge unless you restrict delta uh, and delta prime. So you can see here this guy depends, a priori can depend on, can carry another conformal dimension delta prime. So it will constrain delta and delta prime to take this form. Where lambda is and lambda prime are real. And you've encountered similar stuff in Matthias' lecture before. 
So these are the continuous um, here it's, it's called the principal series of irreducible representation of SO1,3. So this is imposed by by the convergence of, um, of the Mellin integral. And this is uh, something that was worked out by Sabrina Pastersky and Shuhang Shao. Maybe I can give you some reference, by the way, for these conformal primary wave functions. Um, so, I guess Dirac, or Dirac already looked at this, but more recently they were investigated by the Bouens Solodukin um, and also Pastersky, Shao, and Strominger, 2017. Here is the reference for that, and you can find the reference for the De Boer Solodikin paper in, inside this paper. So basically this, this, this statement about the delta function normalizability of the plane waves is translated into the Mellin basis as some restriction on the conformal dimension to lie on the principal series. So um, I will come back to that because there are a lot of subtleties about this uh, spectrum, if you want. But uh, I think this is uh, something that is uh, worth mentioning because actually these modes, these celestial uh, primary uh, wave functions, which, which have these uh, values of delta, correspond actually to normalizable uh, states which have uh, the usual radiative fall off when they go to uh, the boundary of, of space time. But in general, you might wonder what happens if I go off the principal series. So if I take the real part of delta to be two, for instance, and these are also very interesting thing to, to, to look at. As we will see, the stress tensor obviously lies outside this, this principal series, and we will come back to that when I will talk about tomorrow about 2D currents. Any question or comments? Okay, this is, I guess this is just not a question, but just some microphone uh, left open. Otherwise, I didn't understand the question. <laughs> So let me say a few things, a few comments about now spinning conformal primary wave functions because at the end of the day, we'll want to discuss scattering of, of uh, photons, gluons, and gravitons. So uh, spinning, so this was, I, I've written here the, the scalar case. Formal primary wave functions. So, um, spin one first. J equal plus or minus one. So now the confusion is arising because there will be some plus or minus coming that mean uh, plus or minus helicity, and there are some plus or minus which meant outgoing and incoming. I will, I will actually. Now, uh, I will suppress the in and out labels. Because otherwise, we will have too many uh, indices to carry on and rest. So, a spin one primary wave function uh, will carry now a uh, uh, well, it would be, uh, we'll have some 
tensor indices. And let's see, uh, let me write it here. So j equal plus one. So I'm looking at helicity plus here. So it has spin j equal plus one. So it is defined, roughly speaking, as a scalar conformal primary times these uh, tetrad M mu. And uh, there is a, a, I will I will explain that, but let me just write down the expression for the negative helicity. Just to be complete, so now j is equal to minus one. We have a m bar now, times the, conform, the scalar conformal primary. So this carries the helicity uh, piece. And you might uh, think that this, I could have ob obtained a spinning primary just by multiplying the scalar by um, the polarization tensor, but this is not quite true. This M is not the polarization tensor. It is the polarization tensor of uh, plus helicity. This is a notation that I used yesterday. Corrected or shifted by a quantity that depends on the ball coordinate X. And this Q mu times Q dot X. And similarly, M bar gives you the object for the opposite helicity. So again, here plus and minus, they don't denote incoming or outgoing, but the helicity. So um, these things are required in order to have a nice transformation under SL2C. If you just take this uh, polarization tensor for times the scalar primary, you will see that this guy doesn't transform nicely under SL2C. You, are, you have actually to, to take this uh, tetrad uh, thing. And uh, so now with this, spinning one primary, so transforms. And the Lorentz and the Möbius. Now is it will be also transformed as a two D primary of weights H and H bar. But now it's it's also transforming as a, a vector under the bulk transformation. So this is the same transformation as for the scalar, ex except that now it's transformed as, as it should under the Lorentz uh, action. Notice that there is some um, intrinsic gauge fixing into this, uh, this definition. I don't want to mention too much on that, uh, but basically these guys I mean, uh, are naturally in Lorentz gauge, but just because of the equation satisfy for, for the scalar primaries. And similarly, and then I will stop uh, bombing you with definitions, but we have a spin two, spin two primary, which is there is plus or minus two. And this will define for us later on the currents that play a role in, in celestial CFC. So for plus helicity, this is nothing, but now you need to take two of these amps here. And similarly for J1 minus two, where you take the bars. And now these guys will uh, transform uh, as a tensor under the Lorentz group. And it satisfies the, so this thing satisfies the linearized equation of motions. So 
So yeah, basically, if it's in the so-called the donder gauge, this will just be box of h min u equals zero. Yeah, a bit more complicated if you relax the trace uh, and the Lorentz condition on it, but yeah. So just to finish, so it's an important as it's an important thing that. Um, the fact that to have this nice transformation, you have to add this piece, will make uh, this object qu quite not equivalent to just the polarization tensor times the scalar one, but they will actually be uh, gauge equivalent to that. But we, we have heard in the first lecture that the gauge, all that has to be with gauge, we have to be very careful because there are some gauge transformation or diffeomorphisms that do not uh, uh, die at the boundary, and we have to keep track of all that. And actually, it would be uh, it crucial to, to keep these uh, gauge transformations, because some of them can be non-zero at the boundary. And so just to tell you that the relationship between simply the polarization tensor times the scalar primary, these guys is gauge equi or uh, diffeomorphic equivalent to, to it. So I'm not writing the explicit expression for xi, xi mu. You can find it in the in the in the Pastersky paper. This the form, the exact form is not very important, but you can already see that there are weird thing happening when delta equal uh, to one. So for this value of the conformal dimension, uh, you can see that the naive uh, uh, spin two conformal primary is no longer well defined. It just reduces to a pure uh, diffeomorphisms. And this is actually uh, tight and in one-to-one -one correspondence with the presence of super translation and of this uh, super translation current that I have presented yesterday. And I will go back to it. So here I just want to say watch out when delta equals to one and also when delta is equal to minus one, but this I don't want quite to uh, discuss this. When delta equals to one, this guy is a pure diffeomorphisms or sometimes called a Goldstone mode associated to the breaking of super translation symmetry. So far it's not clear why this has to do with super translations, but um, I wanted to mention this uh, already at this stage. And similarly for the AMU, so the AMU uh, is gauge equivalent to uh, to epsilon mu times the scalar guy. Uh, right, and the factor is delta minus one over delta. So you can see again that delta equal zero and delta equal one seem to be important value of the conformal dimension. And indeed, this guy will define for us some Goldstone mode associated to the breaking of large gauge transformation at the boundary. So now this alpha uh, is the gauge can be large. Namely, it doesn't die at the boundary in gauge transformation. Again, watch out when delta equals to one. And this will actually uh, define for us what people have been calling a conformally soft operator in celestial CFT for these specific values of delta. Any question? Before I, I, now we have all the, all the relevant quantities and transformations to, to talk about celestial amplitudes to define a celestial amplitude in the last uh, 10 minutes.
Sorry, I didn't quite understand. Are you mm -hmm. saying that all A mu's are gauge equivalent to that particular form? With delta minus one over delta? So this is an exact statement, this. Uh, this is just, so what I mean is that um, this A mu, so this is just an equality that follows. If you take, you remember you, you, the expression for phi delta was roughly speaking one over Q dot X to the delta times some I and some gamma of delta. So if you take this and multiply it by that, you will be able to write it in this form. So the first term will just give you this piece. And the other guy, um, I'm sorry that I'm not sure I have the, the expression for, for alpha here. Oh yes, I have it. So that you can take if you want that you agree with this, but the, alpha, the expression of alpha is just epsilon times x divided by the delta times minus q dot x to the delta. So this is just a, an equation you can check easily. What I meant is that this a mu is not exactly equal to epsilon times the scalar one, but is gauge equivalent to it. So they just differ by gauge transformations, but Usually we don't care about like gauge transformation. We just say, yeah, I mean, we drop these. But as we have seen in the first lecture, there are some gauge transformation that are non-zero at the boundary and they act non-trivially on the state. So, so we better keep them. And indeed we'll see that this will define for us when delta equal to one, these uh, 2D currents that I call GZ. And the point is you need that extra term for it to transform nicely in the SL2C. Yes, exactly. So it's because if this guy doesn't uh, doesn't transform in a nice way, but this object does. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Do you also get like a funny zero at delta equals to two in some other thing that you had the super translations, no, to so, somewhere? So, yes, yeah, so the special value for us will be one, zero, and two. So delta equal to two, as you might guess, we has to do with the stress tensor for, gravi for the graviton conformal primary. And the delta, did you ask about delta equal zero or uh, Delta equal Two, I think it is the super rotation with this called yeah, the Vidasoda yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah, delta equal no? two. And then I will mention some, this, this shadow transform, oh. which exchanges ah, okay, delta okay. with the two minus delta. Ah, so. so the delta equal two and delta equal zero are related via ah, okay. a shadow transform. Okay, okay, that, they, okay thanks. I will, I will uh, define what is a shadow transform tomorrow. Good, so in the last uh, seven minutes, we can finally define a, uh, what is um, celestial amplitude. So basically, uh, we, are, we, are over, over, we have already encountered that, but okay. So a celestial amplitude, 3.3. So if I write the usual S matrix element, these are the usual uh, momentum basis. So we talk about uh, state somehow, and now we'll talk about wave functions. We'll talk about um, amplitudes of n particles. Now we have a precise way. Before I was a bit sketchy, but now, so we have a precise way to define that. So as I've said over and over, massless particle is parameterized by an energy, a point, that's at bar, with it versus the sphere. Um, and this is the helicity. 
So this is the usual way we express amplitudes in this momentum basis. Um, so for massless, actually, yeah, I'm, I'm focusing on, on massless case. Maybe I will say a word on massive case. The celestial amplitude is, diff so I will call it uh, curly C now, involving N particle, will be labeled now by two other quantum numbers, the, this conformal dimension and the spin. And it's just defined as taking N times a Mellin integral, one for each leg. of the usual momentum basis amplitude. So, where here the identification between the L and the J is just really in, in the identification between the helicity and the spin, as I have mentioned before and we trade the energy for this delta. And this is the definition of a, of a celestial amplitude. For the massless case, this map is simply defined um, with the Mellin transform. But for, and for a massless case, it's a bit uh, more tricky, but there is also a way to define, to make an integral transform which is such that the scattering of massive particle will always transform nicely under SL2C. Uh, so for, try this in words. So this is just to go a little bit beyond what um, what I uh, have presented so far, we, where I focus only on, ma on massless particles. Uh, there is so, the map uh, involves now no longer the Mellin transform, another world transform. Um, which is built from the tool from a CFT embedding formalism and involves the bulk to boundary propagator from ADS propagator. So this is just um, a common, if you're interested in into the massive case, which I have to say is much less understood from a celestial uh, holography perspective than the, than the massless case. So I'm just writing uh, down uh, the reference for that. If you're interested in looking at this, how you can uh, uh, obtain a celestial uh, amplitude for massive particles. But so the important point and the upshot of all this is that for both cases here, uh, so this is another, not a melin, what I meant is not a melin transform, but something else. But for both cases, by constructions, by construction, celestial amplitudes, uh, transform covariantly under SL2C. This meaning again that if I act with SL2C, by, de by design, I will have an N 
for endpoint function. Well, m time these this sort of factors, where the ages are the weights of each associated to each uh, scatterer. Okay, so h i is again it's just delta one half delta i bar half delta i minus j. Okay, so what you can do now that you have uh, this uh, recipe to build celestial amplitudes, you can take any uh, formula uh, for your favorite amplitude. And the first one that were computed in this celestial basis were the three point maximally helicity violating gluon amplitude. And um, I will not uh, write down this because I'm running out of time. But just so that you have an idea of what it looked like, you can really explicitly compute, check that the amplitude you obtain, uh, so example, three point uh, MHV, ampli uh, MHV gluon amplitude. You can do the exercise. This is the reference for the paper. You do uh, three Mellin transform, and then you get, so you start from the, the amplitude you know from the f formula, of, and then you obtain that the celestial amplitude for let's say two minus helicity and one plus gluon. So there are subtleties you have to go in the split signature because, and take z and z bar real and independent, but uh, basically you will find these sort of expressions. that you recognize as a three-point function in a 2D CFT. There are some subtleties that I don't have time to discuss, but you can ask me. There, is a, there are some delta function in the z-bar coordinates. This is inherent to the slow point functions. Uh, you can ask me more on that, but you recognize this as the usual form of a three-point function with the given weights. This is a standard uh, expression with definite weights where this lambdas. So remember that delta i. So here they are also um, lying on the principal series. And delta i is 1 plus i lambda i. And this is just, I'm just, and then I'm, I'm done writing. Just the specific form it takes. So you can actually check for a bunch of uh, amplitude that performing this integral makes all this uh, CFT looking like transformation to be uh, very manifest. So this has also been checked for mass, massive particle and, and for other sorts of particle, but um, I will uh, just stop here. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much.